This week we're continuing on the second part of our series that's called Beyond Ourselves. And this series is about going beyond being self-focused and it's about serving others. And why I love that we're doing this in the summer, because honestly, in the summertime, it's so easy to get focused on our schedule. It's so easy to get focused on what we want to do and all of the things that we have to accomplish that we sometimes forget about other people. And sometimes we forget that God has called us. He has put us on mission and that he has something for us to do in this season and that, that our hearts need to be surrendered to him through all the seasons. And Jesus, he constantly teaches about it. He models it. He demonstrates it ultimately at the cross. We know that. The ultimate act of servanthood is the cross. But there's a passage in John where we're studying that we've been reading. And it's a beautiful passage about Jesus washing the feet of the disciples. And I'll tell you, it's a radical story, and that's what we've been, we've been looking at. If you're joining us today and you're new, we've been reading this passage, and we'll be studying it. We'll be starting in the first part, second part, and there will be another part coming up. But I want you to grab your Bibles for John 13. We're going to be reading John 13, 1 to 17. John 13, 1 to 17. If you have your Bibles, I'm reading from the NIV version. It says this. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress. And the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I'm doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part in me. Then Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him. And that was why he said not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set an example that you should do as I have done for you. Verily, truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. God bless his word. I love this moment. This moment that's captured by John in, in scripture and Again, if you're joining us, we know that that washing of the feet was common in the time of Jesus. You know, the, the footwear of choice was sandals and there was a lot of walking to do. The, the ground wasn't cleaned. So it was common for guests to wash their feet as they entered the homes. The radical part about this passage is that job was for servants only. Only servants would wash the feet of those coming in the house. But we see what? Jesus taking on the position of a servant, taking the task that a servant would do in washing his disciples' feet. Not only the God of the universe, but the rabbi, the teacher. We see getting low and washing the feet of his students. And they're shocked. 
They're surprised, and, but, but Jesus is doing something so special here. He's, he's teaching them about servanthood, but he's also demonstrating servanthood. He's demonstrating how loving them, what loving them looks like, that it looks like action. And we've been studying this passage, and this is the key text for our series, Beyond Ourselves. And it, and it shows us how to serve others. Last week, we, we focused on what? We said, get over yourself. We got to get over ourselves to serve. We see this in the passage. It's identified to us in Jesus. We got to get over our pride. Get over our position. Get over just looking at ourselves, being self-focused, and start to look at the needs of others. This week, we're focusing on the actual doing of servanthood. The actual action of serving. You see, the prayer is today and throughout this series, throughout this summer, is that servanthood wouldn't be just a concept that you agree with. It wouldn't just be something where you're like, yeah, that's good. That's something good that we should do. But it's, it's something that you live your life with. It's demonstrated. It's not just information in your minds, but it drops to your heart and then it, it impacts how you you handle your schedule. It impacts how you relate to your neighbors. It moves from your hands to your feet. You see, as God gives you his heart, as the spirit opens your life and leads you to others, may we be the ones who then do the work. Maybe, may we be the ones to do the work and take action in servanthood and, and be like Jesus who took action. Why do we need to emphasize, emphasize this? Why are we spending time on this? Well, because I have found this, that oftentimes there is a gap. There is a gap sometimes between our words and our actions. Sometimes there's a gap between our good intentions and our good deeds. And I'll tell you, there's nothing worse in my experience. There's nothing worse than, you know, somebody who says, you know, I'm gonna help, I'm gonna be there. You know what? Paul, like, I'm going to be there in your life. I'm going to help you out. But then when the time comes, they don't show up. That ever happened to you guys? You know, maybe you're planning a birthday party or you're moving in your home. You're planning some, th something and the people around you are like, no problem. Go ahead, brother. Go ahead, sister. We're going to be there. You book the truck. You start... You <laughs> You book the truck, you're looking at your phone like, where is everybody? Are they going to come? They don't show up. Or how about this? You know, sometimes you're, you go through a life event and it's this, and you're, you're thinking, man, this life event has happened. Maybe you, you have an accident, an injury, or, or you, you break up with the love of your life. There's just change in your life. And you're like, no, no worries. I'm going to be okay. I have people around me who say they love me. They're going to help me. And when that event happens, you're like, where do they go? <laughs> that ever happened to you? You see, there's this, this gap that takes place. And sometimes that happens to us. But let me tell you, on the other side, I'll be the first one to, to raise my hand and say that I'm guilty. Sometimes I'm the other person who doesn't show up. You know, and the young people call it what? They say, you've been ghosted. <laughs> <laughs> Nowhere to be found, right? That's a little lesson there for, for, the, for a little hip culture. But anyways, but yeah, see, we, that we experience it, but if we're honest to ourselves, we look in the mirror, sometimes we're the ones who don't show up as well. But we have good intentions. We want to be those people. We say in our heart, I'm going to show up, brother. I really believe that. But then busyness comes. Our schedules conflict. Something happens and we don't do the work of serving. And you see, as followers of Jesus, we need to close the gap. That our, that our words would be aligned with action. That as followers of Jesus, that everything we say, we do. And that, that's what we're talking about today. You see, the passage that we are reading this morning in John 13, you know, in, in John 13, 17, it's, it doesn't say you will be blessed if you agree with this. It doesn't say you will be blessed if you think this is a good idea. It says you will be blessed if you if you do this, see, if you serve, if you do the work of serving, and that's why today the, 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 the title of our, our, our the, the part today is called Words to Deeds, 
May our words not stay words, but move to deeds. That there would always be action aligned to what we say. That there's an intentionality with our schedule, a life. That we can say that we do the hard work of serving. And that's what we're looking at today, closing that gap. Jesus models this in the text. He models action. Look at John 13, 4 to 5. It says, he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin, began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. What do we see in this passage? Jesus did the work. He did the work. He got up. He poured out the water. It says, it's so specific in the text. He washed and dried, washed and dried. Well, I'm already tired saying it. I'm only saying it. I only said it three times. Jesus did it 12 times. He did the work. He was a God of action. And I'll tell you today, it was impactful in the lives of the disciples. You see, words are fantastic. We know that the Bible says that words can bring life or death. We know that words are important for instruction. They're important for encouragement. Words matter. But let me tell you, words can quickly become empty when there's no action behind it. See, to live impactfully, your words have to line up with some action behind it. And Jesus, we find, is living an impactful life. Why? Because everything he says, he does. Everything he teaches, he demonstrates. You see, it's so powerful. He didn't just teach about servanthood. He served. In the same way, my friends, we know he doesn't just tell us he loves us, but what? He dies on the cross. He is a God of action. That is Jesus, the one who moves. Let me remind you today that he is the living word. That he is the word demonstrated. That we see God moving through Jesus. That, that I know more about God because I can see it through the life of Jesus. He's the living word. John 1, 14 says, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. See, our God not only says, but he does. We don't serve a God of inactivity. He is always working always moving. He has promises that he has declared on your life and he is working to fulfill them. He is a God of action. And he is, the, the spirit of Jesus is the one that lives in us. And as his disciples, as he has charged them to action, he charges us as well to action. The truth that we have to embrace as being servants of Christ is that our faith in him leads us to action. We have to remember that our relationship with Christ, the spirit inside of us, it leads us to good works. It leads us to good deeds. James says this. He says, if, if faith with no deeds is what? Dead. James 2, 14 and 19 says, what good is it, my brothers and sisters? If someone claims to have faith but has no deeds, can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister was without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God. Even the demons believe that and shudder. Is that so powerful at the end? I'm like, whoa, even the demons, don't worry. You're not a demon, okay? But he says, even the demons believe it and shudder. Why is he bringing that up? What does that mean? Let, let me tell you. See, even the, 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 the demons believe in their mind. Intellectually, they agree that God exists. They agree that he is God. 
but they have not received them in, his li in their life. There, there has been no change to them. They're, they're still living and moving in darkness because they do not receive Christ in their life. But us, the children of God, not only know he exists, it's not just information to us, but we have received him into our hearts. The spirit of Christ has, has come within us and has changed us and transformed us. That now we operate and we live more like Jesus. We look like Jesus. We do the things Jesus would do. That is the difference between us and the demons. We don't only believe God, but he is within me and changing me, transforming me. And that's why we move to good deeds. Because the spirit inside of us is working as we live like Jesus. You see, good works are the fruit of our relationship with God. Good works are the, the fruit of a faith that's alive. But, but let me be clear here, because I know there might be some who are just learning about God or, or, or knowing about the faith. I want to be very clear. We can't mess up this order. You see, good works are the result of our faith and belief in God. But salvation is not the result of good works. You cannot earn salvation. We have to know the difference today. And I want to emphasize that because if you believe that your good works will save you, my friends, that is not true. Only Jesus can save you. You see, there might be people here saying today, I'm just going to do good works and live a good life and that will, it, it, it'll all work itself out. I will live in heaven and in paradise because I'm a good person. God surely knows, my friends, good deeds can't forgive you. Good deeds can't cleanse you. Good deeds can't reconcile you back to the Father. Your good deeds can't save you. Only Jesus can save you. It's only by the blood that is shed. And the good news is that it's free. It's a gift. You don't need to earn a salvation. But God in his goodness and his kindness, it's by faith and grace that we are saved. That anyone at this moment, you don't need to wait till you're a good person, but accept Jesus. It's a gift to all of us. You see, you can't earn salvation. But the thing is, is our life doesn't end with salvation. It starts at salvation. You see, our life doesn't end at the cross. It starts at the cross. And once we receive him in our life, you know, we're a sinner. We accept him into our life and we're saying, God, renew my heart, renew my mind. And the spirit of God sanctifies us. The spirit of God transforms us. We become more like him. Then what? Good deeds start to flow out. Good work starts to flow out as he equips us. And that's what it says in Ephesians. Ephesians 2, 8 to 10 says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. See, my friends, God doesn't just want you to feel the goosebumps of his love, but he wants that love to transform you change you, shape you, compel you to make a difference in this life. I want to remind us today, we are the children of God. We are the set apart ones. We have been commissioned by Christ, <laughs> equipped by him to do the good work in this world. We are the chosen ones. We are the workers in the field. That is who we are, and that is what Christ empowers us to do. And it's important today as a church, I, I, we always have to remind ourselves that we don't just preach the gospel, but we live the gospel. That everything that we say, we obey. That the word of God that, that we tell others, we also follow it ourselves. That there's no gap between our words and our deeds. And Jesus, he, he, he teaches 
He, the disciples at the time, you got to remember the Pharisees, very religious, knew the laws, knew all those things, but yet there was a gap. They knew the law, didn't follow it. And Jesus warns the crowds, he warns the disciples, don't be like them. He calls them hypocrites. He says, don't be like them. Why? They don't do what they say. He says this, Matthew 23, 4, they tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on other people's shoulders. But they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. These are the religious people. These are the ones who know God. There's a gap. And that's why I want to encourage us today and remember that it's so easy for our faith to fall into inactivity. It's so easy for this gap to grow in our life, but we have to remember that a faith that is alive is, a, is a one that's working. It's one that's doing, and it's doing it with Christ. Our faith leads us to action. So I want you to turn to your neighbor today and write this in the chat, say, do the good work. <laughs> do the good work. Do the good work. You gotta do it. How do we put this into practice? Putting it into practice. What do we see that Jesus models for us? What is it that I wanna encourage you in today? The first thing I wanna tell you is this. Moving to activity requires this. That we take every opportunity to serve, to act, to, 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 to act in people's lives. We have to be the ones that are proactive. That as an opportunity comes up to serve, take it. Take the opportunity, take every opportunity. In the passage of Jesus, we see that as he sees an opportunity, what? Jesus takes it. It doesn't matter how low or how, how, uh, how much he would have to give up, but he takes that opportunity. He doesn't let the moment pass, but he does the work. We establish in the first part of our series, we all have needs, right? Your neighbor to your right and to your neighbor to your left, they got stuff going on. We all got stuff going on. And, and you would be, you know, oblivious if you didn't know that people have things going on in their life. It's not just us who have things, but everyone around us has things going on. So as we are looking for the needs, we have to know that when they're presented to us, take the opportunity. Take the opportunity to fulfill it. Don't let that moment pass. Especially, my friends, yes, pray about it, but let me tell you, especially if it's in your capacity, if it's in your ability to meet the need, meet the need. Meet the need. You know, I'm reading this passage about Jesus, and he's teaching about servanthood, and we realize Jesus doesn't ask his disciples, hey, guys, you wash his feet, you wash their feet. I'm going to teach you about servanthood today. But what? He does the work. He takes it upon himself. He meets the need. And I want to encourage you today, I love prayer. I believe prayer is one of the best things that you can do for anyone in your life. You, to go before God and to petition to a living God to move on the behalf of someone else. That there is nothing like that. And that is one of the best gifts you can do for anybody. I love it. But let me tell you on the other hand, I think sometimes the church is guilty of using prayer as an excuse for inactivity. See, sometimes we're able to meet the needs, but then we turn to God and say, God, you, you meet the need. And, we, and, and I want to open our minds to, so, to remind you, you are equipped by Jesus and that you could be the answered prayer. You know, if someone's praying for something, it could be that God is sending you. So if you have it in your capacity, in your ability to meet the need, meet the need. You see, sometimes it comes, but we're, it's just too inconvenient for us to do it. But take the opportunity. Instead of asking for God to intervene, obey God's instruction and direction to help the person in need. See, what do I mean by this? If you, you know, someone in your life needs a job and you know a couple people, connect them. Work, help them out. If you take the opportunity, if you, my friends, are gifted with building stuff, praise, thank God for you. If you are gifted in that way, take the opportunity, help your neighbor, fix their fence. 
You see them struggling? That's me. Come help me, please. <laughs> Take the opportunity. I'm, my friends, if you are blessed with resources and someone comes up to you and is like, man, I don't know, we're just going through a tough time right now. Yes, pray for them, but give to them. Take the opportunity. We have to know that as just as Jesus was sent to the broken world, when Jesus, before he, he goes in a sense, he says, I am then sending you to the broken world. Remember that in, in John 20, 20 to 21 to 22, he said again, Jesus said, peace be with you. He's talking to the disciples and he says, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Is that so powerful? You see, we could be the answered prayer that God is sending to our neighbors. We have to take the opportunity. And when, you know, even in the Old Testament, when Moses was talking to the people of God in Deuteronomy, when he was encouraging them, he was reminding them, hey, you're the solution to the poor. He was reminding them, hey, you're the ones who should give to them. Don't be tight-fisted. Don't be greedy. And he, he says this in Deuteronomy 15, 11, There will always be poor people in the land. Therefore, I command you to be open-handed towards your fellow Israelites who are poor and needy in your land. He says, you're the solution. See, there will always be needs around us. There will always be people who need something. There's always something that people are going through. Let us be the ones who are equipped, called, empowered, received of the Holy Spirit to be the ones to help those who are in need. But the, but the, the, the thing that we have to watch is that we don't look at it as opportunities as inconveniences. That's what we have to watch. That we don't look at when people present their needs to us, it's an inconvenience, it's a disruption. You know, the life of Jesus is so beautiful. I'm reading through the passages of, of Jesus' life and how many people, how many needs are presented to Jesus. How many things he's doing. And he never looks at it as an inconvenience. I'm reminded of Luke 8, remember Jairus, the synagogue leader? He's like, Jesus, my daughter has died. Come help. And then after Jesus is talked by the woman with the issue of blood, he's like, oh, heal me. And if I was Jesus, I'd be like, oh my gosh, these people are so needy. My God, can I just, I'm on my way. Can I come back? He's so, not like that. He, he, he doesn't look convenient. their needs to Christ. He says, this is an opportunity to display who God is. This is an opportunity to display the love of God. The power of God. You see, I'm going to take this opportunity so that they may see who the Father is. And the challenge to us today is that when the needs are presented in your life, will you look at them as inconveniences or will you say, this is my opportunity to show them who God is? To show them the power of God. To show them the love of God. This is my opportunity. This is how they will see the love of God. And know that I am his disciple. Take the opportunity. We need to take it. This is what Galatians 6, 9 to 10 says, Let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Proverbs 3, 27 and 28. Do not withhold good from those to whom it is due when it's in your power to act. Do not say to your neighbor, come back tomorrow and I'll give it to you when you already have it with you. My prayer today is that we would take the opportunities and people would see who God is through your life, through what you do, through the good works, that he would be glorified. Turn to your neighbor and say, take the opportunity. Yeah. Write that in the chat. Take the opportunity and what else? Be willing to give. Yeah. Willingly give. You see, servanthood will cost you. 
We have to be generous with our time, generous with our resources, generous with our schedule, generous with what we have. See, servanthood requires us to be generous or else we'll look at everything as an inconvenience. See, in, the passage of Je- in our passage, Jesus, he gave of himself. You know, he got low. He took, all, he took the dirty work. He, he, he gave of his time, his energy, his effort. And we see it throughout scripture. And ultimately what? We see it on the cross. There is no greater love than this, that he lays down his life for his friends. God is generous. He literally gives all of himself. He lays himself on the line as servants of Christ. We are generous. We are generous with our resources, our time, our money, our effort. You know, I, a little bit about myself. I grew up in the business world. So my education, I have a bachelor's in business. And I was in the corporate world for about eight years. And let me tell you, growing up in the business world, you'll find that, you know, you start to be consumed with greediness. Like the principles of business and it focuses on the bottom line, whether you like it or not. Like you start to be conditioned to look at what I have and, and my share, and my wealth, and what am I doing to build up myself, and, and I had to really overcome that spirit. It took me a long time to really embrace generosity, and that might be you today, where you're like, you look at giving as losing. You know, you look at giving as I'm depleting, and, you, and, and it's like, you're, you want to just be focused on what you have and, and, and what, what you want to do. And that's what, and you're worried in your mind. And, but I want to encourage you today. What I have learned is that again and again, we always say this. The principles of God are not the same as the principles of the world. And we have to understand that. Because we can get wrapped up in these principles that, that would lead us to destruction of our soul and everything inside of us and miss what God has actually intended for us to do. And the principle I want to share with you is this, is that when you give, your life gets bigger. And when you hoard, your life gets smaller. That's the principle of God. And you will find that that is my testimony, the testimony of a lot of people here, that when I give, God expands my life. And when I hoard, when I keep to myself and I worry about all my things, my world and my soul gets smaller and smaller. I'm consumed by all these thoughts. I become greedy in my heart. I want to encourage you today. That giving to other people is one of the best investments you can make in your life. Sowing your resources into people, helping them in their life. Let me tell you, it will lay up a treasure for you in heaven that will not deteriorate. That is what the world won't teach you. Is that when you give to others and you give of your resources, God, the good giver, gives you more. And he honors you. Yes, We need to be a good steward, right? We have to take care of our finances. We have to, we're accountable to everything that God gives us. But let me tell you, it's a problem when you're you're just all inward focused. Because the biblical model that Jesus designed for us is that we are generous people. So sow your wealth, sow your money into people. Sow it into people. I'll tell you, God honors it. Both now and for eternity. I need to remind us of eternity. You see, our God, all of the things that we do, we will be accountable to God. There will be one day where we are faced, where God the judge will meet you and will assess your life. And in that moment, everything that is not aligned to what he has asked you to do, all the things that we think are important, the Bible says they will burn away. And only the things that God has asked you, the only the things that that, that you've been faithful to, those things will be rewarded. You see, there will be people on that day 
who are surprised when they go up to heaven and God is, they, they, they're, they're consumed and they have the house, they have the car, they have all these things and they will be surprised when, when God doesn't hold them to account on what's in your bank account. But God asks them, what did you do with the people around you? See, that's what God will judge. And we have to let that sink into our minds, especially the young generation, that, that it's important that we lay up a treasure in heaven. Because that's what will last for eternity. It's, it's what will last for eternity. And, and when Timothy is charged by Paul to talk to the rich people, this is what it says in 1 Timothy 6, 17 to 19. Command those who are rich in the present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do be good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age. Look at this, this passage. So that they may take hold of the life that, true, that is truly life. Wow. So willingly give. Your father will reward you for all of eternity. But also know that he's going to take care of you here on earth. You know, because of your generosity, God is faithful to the generous. He's a good father. What you sow here on earth, you will reap. I love the quote by Anne Frank. You guys probably know it where she says, No one has ever become poor by giving. No one has ever become poor by giving. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 to 8, we know that Paul says, Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give. Not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able, God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. That's the God we serve. So give cheerfully, my friends. Give with joy in your heart, knowing that the hand that you give, the hand that you use to give is now positioned and open to receive from God. Give cheerfully, knowing that the hand that you give out with is now open to receive from God. That is the principle that we have to understand. It's like this with money, our time, our resources, our energy. Don't waste it. It's, it's, it's never a waste when you give it to people. You invest it in the lives of others. What you reap, you will sow. He is faithful. Proverbs eleven twenty five. 25, a generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. You see, I know, and I, you know, a moment of honesty, Champion Life Center, we're a generous church. I'm going to tell you that. We are generous. We are generous people. And I'm so proud to be a part of this house that we give. We're givers. We are. But I that external pressures are difficult. That there are things that are working against us. And that's why I want to remind you here today, continue to be generous. Continue to do good. God is faithful. Continue to give. Continue to lay up your treasure in heaven. Remember, everything in this world will fade away. But God and what you do and, and, and what you're faithful to him in, that will remain. So be generous. Turn to your neighbor, say, I am generous. And then now open your hand and say, yeah, I'm kidding. I'm ready to receive, and I'm joking. I'm generous. We're generous. You know, continue to what? Be a channel of blessing. Channel of blessing. Why? Because God blesses those who bless others. And it's like he'll continue to bless you when you give to others. That's the principle. The last thing we're going to talk about is this. Do it for God. The action in your life, do it for the Lord. 
Do for him. Serve unto God. We need to know the reason why we're doing these good deeds, it's because we're being faithful to the Lord. It's because we're obeying his command. This is what Jesus said. He said to do this. And we have to remember that it's unto him that we serve. Why is this important? Because sometimes people won't appreciate you. Sometimes you won't get a thank you. Sometimes you'll meet a need in someone's life and they won't even acknowledge you. And you'll grow bitter in your heart unless you know why you are doing it. Yes, it's to bless them. Yes, it's to show them who God is. But ultimately, it's to please my master. And so my life is living sacrifice to God. That my God is pleased with me. And we have to remember that everything we do, we do it for the Lord. As his children, there's a passage that Jesus talks about in the end times. In the end times, there's the, the God in Matthew 25, he will separate the sheep from the goats. I want you to read what he says about his sheep. Matthew 25, 34 to 40. Then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance. The kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, you gave me something to drink. I was thirsty and you gave me some, I, I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. The righteous will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in? Or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. So do it for the Lord. Remember, the Lord sees, the Lord knows, the Lord is pleased. And I want to encourage some of you today who have been giving everything. I want to encourage you today who have, you've given your life. And you're serving and you're serving. Maybe someone hasn't said thank you. Or maybe someone hasn't acknowledged you. And you're, and you're feeling defeated. I want to remind you that the Lord is pleased by your service. He sees. He knows. He knows. Everything that you have given. Every dollar that you have spent. He knows it. He knows Paul in Colossians 3, he's talking to the different roles in the household. Then he comes to the servants and the slaves, the ones who do the, the, the meaningless work, the hard jobs. This is what Paul says to them. Remind you, he's talking to the, the servants. This is what he says in Colossians 3, 23 to 24. He's encouraging them. He says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. I want to encourage you today, when we serve, let us serve unto the Lord. It is Him we are serving. At the end of the day, there is only one voice that matters. At the end of the day, there is only one opinion that counts, and that is the opinion of God. And we pray that on that day, he will say, well done, my good and faithful servant. So serve with all your heart. Do it for the Lord. I'm going to call the worship team up as I close. Today, my prayer is that we move from words to deeds. That we take every opportunity to be generous, to serve excellently before God. That we would go and remember, we are the carriers of the presence of God. We are the called out ones. We are the children of the Most High. That we would remember that we are the light of the world. I want to leave you with this verse in Matthew 5, 14 to 16. It says, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds 
and glorify your Father in heaven. See, how does our light shine? As we do good in the world. The good work that we are equipped by Christ to do in this life will bring glory to the Father.